So um, the next session here is our um, drillers panel. And we're uh, very fortunate today to have three drillers who are from different parts of the country, um, bring a lot of different perspective. And so um, I'm just going to introduce their talks and then we'll, we'll go through those first. We'll run all three presentations and then they're all here. We'll get on uh, together at the end. Um, there's been a number of questions that were asked that I'll provide. Uh, and if you have any for their presentations as we go through it, um, you know, please put those in the chat. So, uh, so the first uh, speaker is going to be Chauncey Leggett from Lake Valley Well Company and his presentations on the life of a well driller, um, which is going to be really interesting, I think. Um, the second is Buddy Sebastian of Sebastian and Sons Well Drilling, Regulators in the Water Industry, the Importance of a Working Relationship, and which is what we strive to, uh, why we have a drillers panel, is we want everyone to work together. I think there's a lot of advantage there. And our third one is from Jeremy Bach from Bach Well Drilling. Uh, uh, exempt wells, how overregulating can cause unforeseen circumstances. And this is out west where um, we certainly have a lot of different water rules than some of us have like in the Midwest. And uh, it's an interesting perspective because of all the additional uh, issues that they certainly have there. Thank you gentlemen for being here um, and here we go. My name is Chauncey Leggett. I'd like to talk to you about the life of a well driller. I am the owner operator of Lake Valley Well Company. I've been in the water well business for 38 years. I'm a licensed water well contractor in North Carolina and Virginia. I hold electrical license in North Carolina and I'm an accredited uh, heat pump installer, uh, vertical loop specializing uh, with geothermal. I also participate in the voluntary program of the North Carolina, of the National Groundwater Association um, Certified Water Well Driller and Pump Installer. Um, I'm a member of the National Groundwater Association. I'm currently a director on the board of the National Groundwater Association. I'm a member of the North Carolina Groundwater Association and currently the past president as well of that association. I'm also a member of the Water Systems Council. A little history of Lake Valley Well Company. I started my company back in 1984. Uh, we start out boring wells and installing pumps. Uh, we installed septic tank systems for a while. Uh, we drilled wells, sand wells, or screen wells, and open-ended rock wells. We installed geothermal heat pump uh, exchange, heat exchange systems, um, specializing in the vertical hole. Uh, we installed water treatment and we do well her rehabilitation. So presently, I guess you could say I'm a full service water well company. As I grew my company, so did I. I've learned how to wear many hats, uh, from learning how to drill wells, being a mechanic, uh, welding, using a cutting torch, um, being a communicator, uh, learning how to run a successful business. Um, you wear a lot of hats when you own and operate a small company like mine. Um, for the first 20 years, I tried to do it by myself. Now, when I say that, I still had employees. There's six of us. Um, but as far as doing it by myself, I was a member of these associations I just spoke about, but I never really participated. And then thanks to a, a good friend that has turned out to be my best friend uh, in the industry, and ironically, my biggest competitor um, kept after me to start coming and starting to participate more in these associations. And when I did, a whole new world of opportunity uh, opened up for me. I, I was able to build relationships with, with others in the industry. And I, I've learned that truly we are better together. Uh, the area that I offer my services is here in North Carolina. Um, I work mainly in two regions, the intercoastal plains of eastern North Carolina and the uh, Piedmont, mainly in the east of the Piedmont. Um, the fall line boundary separates those two and, and I live within 10 miles of that fall line. So if I'm going out to drill in the intercoastal plains, I'm usually going out to do mud rotary and those wells are running anywhere from 25 to um, over 400 feet deep. 
if I'm going over into the Piedmont to drill, usually it's going to be with open ended rock wells. Um, and those wells, six inch wells are running between 60 and sometimes over 1500 feet. Who governs and inspects wells that are constructed here in North Carolina? Uh, the Department of Water Quality uh, handle the private well sector. And the DWQ has seven regions in North Carolina that support the 100 counties. And each local county is supported by the uh, Department of Health and Human Resources. Um, and the North Carolina Well Certification Commission falls underneath that. And they are the ones that actually govern the well drillers of North Carolina. I'd like to explain the process that we go through here in North Carolina to create a private water supply. The owner would first go to the local health department and apply for a well permit by filling out an application and paying a fee. Then the local health department would actually come out and look at the property, make sure we meet the setbacks that we're required to meet and draw up a permit with a well area on that permit. Then the owner would contact a certified well driller in North Carolina to come out and drill the well. Now, we, the contractor, would have to have a permit in hand to come out and drill. We would be required to call the health department to come out and inspect our grouting process. And then once the well is completed and we put the pumping system in, we contact the health department again and they come back out and inspect the wellhead, looking for a vent pipe, sampling faucet, well seal, make sure it's just safe for the environment and the user. Then he pull, pulls water samples. Once, once the sample comes back clean, then the well is ready to start being used for human consumption. Now this process can be enjoyable or it can be a nightmare. The key is communication, communication, communication. Good communication creates trust, respect, and a positive working relationship between all parties. There has to be communication between the owner and the inspector. It's good for the inspector in the beginning to sort of just go over a timeline with the owner of the property so you can answer a lot of questions before they're even asked on the process that we have to go through to meet the requirements that the health department has put in place of it, you know, uh, delivering uh, inspections and sampling and, and documentation. So communication is key between those two parties. Also communication between the owner and the contractor is very important. When I'm contacted to drill a well, I like to go out and I meet the client on the property, take a look at the well site, make sure that I should be able to get my equipment in with no problem, uh, explain the performance of the work that I'm gonna be doing and the scheduling of when they can expect me to be there and to communicate with them that there are gonna be some uncontrollable events that I can't control, but with communication, we can work through those such as weather, breakdowns, uh, bad water samples, stuff of that nature. Um, and then to communicate the challenge that we run into and in actually drilling the well, the unknown of the formation, the depth, the casing, the uh, depth to the water and the quality and the quantity of the water we can expect to get. Uh, and then we communicate the price to make sure we understand exactly what our services uh, fee is, and I usually put this on paper with an estimate. Uh, in a driller's world, we, we usually call it a guesstimate because we really don't know what the total outcome is going to be on, on those variables until we drill the well. Um, but in that process, it's good to have great communication between the contractor and the health inspector. Usually when I go into a county that I have not been into in a while or you know, there's some, I'll always call them up, introduce myself and ask them if there's anything special that we need to be doing as far as the construction of this particular well as a source of contamination by where we need to do a little extra, extra layer of protection, uh, communicate on um, when they want the documentation, which would be a GW1 that we do here in North Carolina that tells you everything about the well. Also pulling water samples. Um, when they can come back and pull a water sample and, and, and let me know if it happens to be a bad sample, then we would need to go back out and rechlorinate it as well. 
And then once all that is done and we have um, all the documentation is in, then it's ready for human consumption. And at that point in time, I like to go over with the owner and let the person know there are responsibilities that come um, with owning a well, which would be good practices of pulling water samples annually to make sure it's still safe to drink. Chlorination, maintaining the water system components, maintaining the filtration system equipment if there's one installed, and keeping the pump house and the well area free of any sources of contamination. It's amazing when we go back to these pump houses, uh, we have to sometimes step over cans of gas or around bottles of Roundup. And if we have to go pull the pump out of the well and, and it's sitting in the middle of a dog pen, that's not a good place to have the well or the dog pen. So um, it's good to let the owner know that um, he needs to be able to take care of his private water supply. Frequent challenges that we, the contract to contractor, run into in the field, um, the equipment that we use to perform our services are, is really big and very heavy. And you see the two pictures on the left, uh, the one with the drill rig with the tower up and then the support truck beside it. Both of those pieces of equipment weigh about uh, 68 to 70,000 pounds and both of them are very expensive. Uh, sometimes we get on sites and the, the earth is just not strong enough to hold the weight of the equipment. And you see in this video right here that um, unfortunately it happened to us that particular day. And as you notice, you don't see any mud or anything. It's just dry dirt up top, but there was no bottom on this particular lot. And when I backed off of the road, uh, over, headed to the well area, you see what happened. And it ended up costing um, a wrecker fee to come out and pull me out, a loss of time. And um, luckily we did not break anything on the rig, but you, you're opening yourself up for a lot of breakdowns when things like this happen. So getting to a well area can be challenging sometimes. Back to chlorinating a well. Um, you know, back in the day, the old timers used chlorine, Clorox. Then we started using chlorine. Um, chlorine um, is an oxidizer, so everything in our toolboxes would rust up and um, it, you know, chlorine doesn't work well when the pH in the well is high, so we'd have to put vinegar in it to bring the pH down so the chlorine would be more effective. Um, several years ago, we ran across this product called Sterling that has worked really well for us. Uh, it, it has a long shelf life. It's uh, not as corrosive. It's 55% pure chlorine. It's in a granular, um, easy to mix up, and it has really worked well for us. Over on the right-hand side, you see a picture of a well seal. I just have it sitting on a vise so you can see it. Uh, there's a, a faucet with a, hose, with a backflow preventer and that black hose hooked up to it that goes in through the vent pipe uh, access port and I took the vent pipe out to show you on this video, I mean, this uh, picture that the um, pipe going down through it, we've got holes cut in it so we can recirculate the chlorinated water to wash the walls of the wells down and to treat the whole column of water. And then after that's done, then that hose would be taken off and a water hose hooked up to pump the well off after it stays in the system the appropriate time. Um, from time to time, we have to pull pumps. And there's two techniques that we use. We use a boom truck uh, to pull pumps uh, that are set on rigid pipe. Usually there's uh, above a horse and a half to hold the weight of the pump and the wire. Uh, and then there's a, a picture of a reel that we use on the right to install pumps on poly pipe, black roll pipe. And that reel will hold about 600 feet of pipe and wire. And it works really good for us when we're going out to set a pump you know, five and 600 feet, we usually make it up here on the yard and roll it up on the reel, carry it to the job site, put the pump on the bottom and winch it down in the well. And then if we ever have to come back to pull that pump for various reasons, leaking check valve or broken wire, um, or just to replace the pump, we're able to winch it back out on the reel and keep it up off of the ground away from any contamination. 
and then obviously once we make whatever repairs we come to do and reinstall the pump, we always rechlorinate the well. Um, we also have gotten into some well rehabilitation. This particular well is an agricultural application and you can see on the video on the left is shows you the water shooting out of the jet and then the well on the right shows us with the jet down in the well where we know where the screens are and therefore uh, we can up and go up and down in the well uh, to clean the screen and then once we get it clean reinstall the pump rechlorinate and this well is good to go for multiple years so better together who how when and why who will help protect provide preserve this most precious natural resource we have on this earth is it you is it me who how will we accomplish this through education by communication when today Tomorrow may be too late. Why? It is truly the gift of life. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share a glimpse into the life of a well driller. My name is Chauncey Leggett and my information is below. If you would like to contact me for any questions I may be able to answer. Hello, my name is Buddy Sebastian. I'm Vice President and General Manager of Sebastian and Sons Well Drilling. I'm also President of Michigan Groundwater Association and the Chairman of the Director's Advisory Committee for Eagle in the state of Michigan. I'm here today to talk to you about the importance of a working relation, relationship excuse me, between the water well industry and regulators. Uh, I hope this is very informative to you and uh, I'll be here to answer some questions for you afterwards. So let's carry on. Where do we start? In Michigan, there used to be a advisory board that was a state statute, and that was taken away by executive action quite a few years ago. But the people at Eagle or DEQ at that time and the water well industry were having uh, a lot of issues that were emailing back and forth or discussing back and forth. So they formed a committee Basically, it's the director's advisory committee to advise the well construction unit and the director on issues and how to handle them or if there's need to be law changes or rule changes along the way. Um, it's a good working relationship. Depending on the code or laws in your state, maybe you can put something together like that and it would be a good idea to have the representation set geologically or geographically, depending on if you have the ge same geology throughout the whole state, then do it by commerce, city, so on and so forth. But uh, it's a good idea to have representation from throughout the state, or if you're regional, uh, do it regional. What's the goal? I think we'll all agree that the resource is the goal, protecting the resource. Uh, protecting water is probably one of the best things we can do for our future and our children's future and our grandchildren and so on. Um, I wouldn't say dividing it up and who gets to use it, but let's protect what we do have because it is a renewable resource. Somewhat the hydro cycle has proven that. But when you set this joint board up in committee at this level, you need to make it about that resource. Don't waste time on past, well, uh, the regulators did this or the industry did that or these people aren't listening to that. Throw that all aside and make it about the resource. Make it about protecting the resource. What we can, can we do to protect the wells? What we can do for wellhead protection? So on and so forth. It's always better to keep that in mind. I know on the boards that I've served, there's a lot of collaboration. And believe it or not, um, there's more that we agree on than disagree on. Uh, and that's okay to disagree. It is. But when you're having a coalition of people throughout the state, which includes regulators, uh, health department officials, sanitarians, health directors, um, 
sanitarians at the state level, people that are uh, overseeing the well construction unit, licensing, uh, Department of Agriculture, when all those people get involved, um, it's a great collaboration because you really get to see the big picture on what's going on uh, in the state. Uh, so it's a great avenue to not only, I don't want to say air grievances, you don't want to do that, but bring up issues that might nobody thought of. Uh, it helps in solving those future problems, okay, or problems that come up. Walking in another's shoes. I always said to all my constituents in the wall drilling industry, you got two choices. The regulators and the people that are regulating and making rules, um, they have a job to do too. Uh, and we all have a boss, including those people. Uh, the bottom line is they're not going away and we're not going away. Uh, so I always say, why don't you take the time, let's listen to some of the issues that they're having with maybe your industry, my industry, uh, homeowners, uh, well owners, uh, maybe even not transient, transient uh, public water supplies. Listen to those issues and maybe together with our insight of how things are done, their insight of how they have to regulate, we can come up with a plan to move forward. Okay, they can also, by listening to the things that we have to deal with on the regulation side, maybe the hurdles, the red tape, uh, maybe help circumvent some of that with either new regulation or uh, amending some of the things that are going on to help further uh, free up some of that time, some of that tape, so that we can actually get the resource to the people that are using it, which is the well owners. Uh, the public water supplies and so on. The one thing that I found in uh, my years in history is that uh, well owners like to know that the industry has good relations with the, with the regulators. They don't really want to ask questions if they think it's going to bring up problems. Uh, they like to have a open channel to both sides, the personal or professional industry and the regulators and try to sift out themselves maybe how to solve their problems if they have one or maybe see the right way to construct a well or not to construct a well and I think it's good if they know right up front that, that the industry has a good working relationship with regulators and with the state. Um, it's always good to have maybe some literature or anything with you as a well professional or even a well owner to have it set up with a direction you can point to. Here's where you go to if you have problems. Here's where you file a complaint. Here's where you go to if you're having problems with disinfection, um, coliform bacteria, whatever it is, nitrates. Uh, it's a good idea to have some place to point to. And, and health departments are really good about it, but I think as water well professionals, we can actually help in that, uh, easing those problems with those customers and point them in the right direction. I always say if you're going to be on a board, you're on there to solve problems. Uh, you want to be positive. Um, if you go in with an attitude that the, uh, well, the, the, that the, well, the water well professionals, if you're a regulator, if you go in that the water well professionals are just there because they have to be there or they're there because they don't like you, uh, that's not the right attitude to go in. The same thing as a water well professional. We need to take the time to understand that these regulators are doing their job and we probably, once they get to know what we go through, they'll understand uh, uh, the trials and tribulations of getting people good, clean, safe water uh, to try to ensure that we're protecting it, to try to ensure that the well is constructed properly and that we're disinfecting properly and that we're installing the pumping system so it's safe and has a long life. Um, if you have an area that you're in uh, that you have a strong point, whether it's well, disinf well disinfection or whatever, uh, grouting, well abandonment, uh, let those skills shine. Uh, offer those skills up to the state regulators. Offer those skills to help when people are having problems. Um, we all have something to offer, but you need to take that problem solver approach. Um, 
and uh, I found this quote, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we created them with. Uh, that is Albert Einstein. So uh, somebody way smarter than me. So and if you think about that, uh, that's a very profound statement. So when you go into a situation where you're negotiating or on a committee to try to solve problems, think about that. Think about that. Okay. In Michigan, some of the examples of the problems we've solved is so we have a director's advisory committee made up of water professionals, state regulators, health department directors, sanitarians, Department of Ag representatives, and agreed that the following technical we all agreed that the following technical committees were necessary. We were having some issues. One was a flowing artesian well committee. Where there's a flowing well problem, the local state gets called on advice. Um, for an example, there was a general thermal contractor that was drilling in an area that he didn't know where he was at. Uh, and in Michigan, uh, you're not licensed to be geothermal. So what ended up happening is there was a flow breakout. Luckily, there was a river right close by. They got the flow channeled to the river and basically had to hire a big cementing company to come in and drill. The uh, well drillers had to drill holes all the way around this flow and actually cement all those holes at the same time to cement that shut. And the, uh, the contractor actually really appreciated that the state had this committee of water well professionals to, uh, and, and state officials too. There's, there's a lot of state officials and county officials that have had high flows in their areas. So everybody collaborated to come up with a plan on how to plug this. Um, the other is an abandonment well, well committee. Uh, again, uh, the committee would call upon with a difficult abandonment, fishing out old uh, pumping equipment, plugging floor wells, plugging large diameter dug wells, uh, plugging wells that you didn't even know were there, trying to locate. Those kind of issues arise, and these committees have helped with that. Uh, the other, uh, excuse me, the other problems that we've also solved, uh, we've come up with some code and water professionals of understanding the code. Uh, there was some very, what I would call gray area things that were in the code and we, as a coalition together, we came up with what we both agreed on as the interpretation. Well, the use and application of proper chemicals was a well treatment. What's approved? What isn't approved? NS, NSF, are they talking about the chemical? What's in the chemical? What are they talking about? Those are some of the things we've solved. Approved equipment for use and the screening of possible new equipment to be approved. Uh, the Water Well Advisory Committee has always uh, opened, if somebody wants a product, they want to get on the market, they bring it to, to Eagle, Eagle brings it to us, we look it all over, look at the pros and the cons, listen to Eagle's concerns, uh, maybe address some of those concerns and move on. Uh, we've also teamed up with the educational events, training both their professionals and our professionals, which has uh, led to a lot of uh, good educational seminars. As professionals, we are all face day to day issues to regulate our industries. Regulars and water well professionals need to work together, okay? Because we need regulation always is going to be out there. And the water well professionals will be here in some fashion for decades. We all use the precious water resource, okay? So rather than fight about, let's embrace it, the fact, and use it and make it as safe and viable as we possibly can for generations. Take action. Get involved. First off, I'd like to thank everyone for attending the Private Well Conference. Even though we are virtual and dealing with other issues, private wells are still the single most important thing a property owner will ever invest in. My name is Jeremy Bach. I'm a fifth generation well driller from Kittitas County which is located in central Washington state. Most of the time I'm out in the field on a drilling rig constructing wells, and when I'm not drilling, I do well siding, pump installation, water sampling, dealing with regulations, and I spend a great deal of time volunteering with groundwater associations for the betterment of the industry and my customers. In today's world, it is not enough to just be a well driller or pump installer. You need to be involved with all aspects of rulemaking and legislative efforts in order to protect an essential industry. 
Today, I'm going to talk about the unintended consequences of overregulation of exempt of exempt well use. As we go through a brief background of what I'd experienced firsthand here in Washington State, you'll see how overregulating the domestic use of water from regulators can have detrimental effects on economies, and ultimately, the private well owner must pay. Washington itself is two states in one. West of the Cascade Mountains, you have the higher population densities, big cities, and in eastern Washington, you have smaller rural agricultural communities. In 1945, the state legislature established the exempt well rule, which essentially states that domestic well use is exempt from water right permitting. This law, law allows people living in rural setting to access drinking water, among other small outdoor uses. It is essential in the lifeblood of rural living. Without this exemption, all rural building would cease to exist. Back in 2007, the Washington State Department of Ecology, our state regulators, received a petition from a three-person group trying to stop the new use of domestic wells. This petition claimed that domestic wells were impairing senior water rights. This petition kicked off a whirlwind of public meetings and ultimately led to a moratorium on new exempt well use in Upper Kittitas County, even though there was not one demonstrated case of impairment that was created from domestic well use. Washington State goes by Western Water Law, which is simply first in time, first in right. If you have historical proof that your water right has been put to beneficial use, you have your place in the line. With Central Washington already have gone through a surface water adjudication starting in 1977 called Aqua Vela case, surface water rights were already spoken for and everyone's use was determined and allocated based on the adjudication. So right now you must be asking yourself, why do surface water rights have anything to do with domestic well use? Well, the Department of Ecology uses the one molecule theory, which is a policy that says if any water withdrawal from has the potential to intercept one molecule of water from someone else, there is an impact to their water right. Washington also has laws that say if you claim impairment, you must demonstrate it scientifically, which is kind of confusing that policy and law contradict themselves in this state. Using the one molecule theory makes everything connected somewhere, somehow, some way, at some point in time. It's a very broad brush to use when making water use decisions for the entire state. So even though the domestic well was in fact exempt from water rights process, if a homeowner potentially was impacting one molecule, it was enough to cause issue now. In a nutshell, these factors created a perfect storm for the upper county moratorium. After many years of moratorium and massive damage to the local building economy, the Department of Ecology came up with a plan to offset these new domestic water withdrawals by creating private domestic water banks to provide mitigation. The state would allow entities to purchase senior water rights, chop them up into small pieces, and then sell them off one by one to property owners. While this concept worked great for the property owners who owned the water rights, the end user ended up paying the price. They would pay in upwards of $10,000 for this small water right on top of what they just paid for the well and pump system, thus pricing many people out of the market to build. Plus it added another layer for property owners to unravel when they're trying to obtain a building permit. The main problem with private water banking being the only avenue was that it ultimately gives private water bank owners the final say when it comes to building. Unelected people making decisions for the county based on profits and not what was good for the citizens. Pretty much bad policy. Since water rights are tied to certain areas and drainages, the other major issue that was created was water right availability. Not all drainages have water rights. If your property happened to be in one of those areas, it became dry pasture land, 
since you could not access water rights. A person who bought buildable property pre moratorium ended up with property that was completely worthless since they did not have access to water rights in order to build. They would call these areas red zones. And at first there was a lot of red zone properties as you can see in the maps. You could still drill a well, but just couldn't use it legally and apply it towards a building permit. Eventually, the Kittitas County Auditor had to reevaluate these red zone properties and adjust the taxes, creating less tax revenue for the county budget. Like most governments, this created problems since their main purpose is to expand their tax base in order to spend money on services and projects for the taxpayer. With a lot of pushback from private water bank owners, the county eventually adopted their own county ran water bank. This new county ran water bank would serve most of Kittitas County since at this time mitigation was required throughout the county and not just upper Kittitas County. The private banks could still provide water, but the county's water bank had sideboards on it like only charging the actual cost of the water rights plus administrative costs. This created a level playing field since private water banks could charge whatever they felt like charging. It did not take long for them to lower their prices in order to compete with the county pricing structure, which at the beginning was about half the cost of the private water. Once this county ran water bank was up and running, the local health department would oversee the program for providing the smaller water rights to homeowners, now being called mitigation certificates. A customer would check to see if their property was eligible for county mitigation, do a site drawing showing all measurements to streams and water bodies, then proceed to drill their well. Once the well was complete, then they could buy the mitigation certificate in order to apply for building permit. It added a few more steps to the process for the property owner. You can imagine this created a massive undertaking for a small rural health department that really had no background in water rights and water banking. Mapping was needed, a metering program was developed in order to track new domestic water use, and they had to add staff in order to address these new programs. So, like most government programs, it grew bigger. As time goes on and more water rights are bought by Kittitas County in order to keep up enough mitigation certificates for availability in the future, it's starting to create some problems with the size of the program. But this, of course, is needed for a county that continues to grow at a rapid pace. But like most programs, they start out with the best of intentions and bad ideas can get added along the way. Some of the rules that only apply to county mitigation are stricter setbacks from streams and different types of well construction requirements. Some properties have up to 500 foot setback requirements for certain designated streams. If your well is sited within these setbacks, it will need to be constructed differently. This alone can cost the property owner thousands of extra dollars if they happen to have streams on their property. Strict setbacks not only impact the property owner's ability to use their land, but it also creates unbuildable property that may be oddly shaped that cannot accommodate added setbacks upon the ones already needed for well and septic. While some setbacks are needed to protect the resource, they should be done responsibly and based on science. Probably the funniest part about the last issue with mitigation water is that if the property owner buys private water instead of county water, they're exempt from these extra setbacks. So the county water bank ends up being a catch-22. It started out as the most cost-effective alternative and ends up having more onerous setbacks in the end that makes parts of the property unusable. The common theme throughout this entire time of exempt domestic well issues in Kittitas County is unintended consequences. Ultimately, the property owner who is just trying to build a house must pay the price. 
be it with the added burden of the long cumbersome process to obtain building permit then on top of that lots of extra money spent that would otherwise go into the building budget doing finishing touches on their house landscaping whatnot seeing this firsthand and living through the problems that were created made for interesting 14 plus years for me and my customers throughout these events and even to this day i spend extra time helping my customers go through the process and educating the public on the issues on how we got here and help guide them through the new process. Hopefully letting people know throughout the country will help when faced with domestic water issues and let decision makers stop and think. There are smarter ways to deal with domestic water than knee-jerk reactions and overregulation. Listening to the science, hydrologists and drilling community can create some real good real world solutions to an ever-changing issue that will not go away as long as rural areas continue to grow. Thank you for your time. I know it's a lot of information to go over in a short amount of time, but I'll be more than happy to answer any more of your questions and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Great, thanks you guys. And I see what, I'm getting some feedback. So I'm not sure what, but let's see. Yeah. Um, so there are a number of questions that have been asked. Um, somebody needs to turn down their volume for what you're hearing from me. Uh, buddy, you are muted, so it's not you. Um, so it's either Chauncey or Jeremy, I think. Um, so I put some questions in the chat um, from before, as well as have been asked today. Um, like Joseph Sapinski asked a question and I took part of it off just because it's, uh, it was easier not to put all that on the screen. So I'm going to pop up some questions. Um, I'm going to start with the one I put on here. Chauncey, for a new well, what are you required to test for? You mentioned that when you drill a well, you have to get it sampled and it has to be approved or pass a test. What does that entail? Well, first of all, it, uh, just coliform and um, E. coli bacteria. But within 30 days, it's a whole list of um, FHA uh, sampling that needs to be done as well. But just for the homeowner to move in, we just need a clean bacteria test. Okay. Um, oh, I'm in the wrong one. Okay, so I'm getting confused here. So uh, Joseph Stepinski asked this in the chat and I just took a piece of it. Um, he's with the Indiana, he's a field inspector. Um, said, Chauncey, we don't allow wells that do not have a well casing that is less than 50 feet or they need to have a waiver with increased sampling for bacterial monitoring or addition of treatment like chlorine. Are there any rules similar in North Carolina or in other states? And really, this is a question for all of you. Um, you can go first, Chauncey. Yes, in North Carolina, we have to have at least 21 foot of casing. In certain counties and even in certain areas in particular, in uh, particular counties, we have to have uh, 63 foot of casing or 42 foot of casing. In some areas you can use PVC, some some you have to use steel. So every county um, that we work in, uh, back in my presentation, I, I said I always go back into the county to make sure that we're doing what they're asking us to do in that particular county. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, Michigan, uh, the minimum requirement is 25 feet for casing, and our requirements are, are set by the state. The only thing that would change is if the county had a, a longer isolation distance because of maybe there's no overburden or anything, but uh, most of the states are 25 feet minimum casing. Jeremy? Uh, well, in Washington State, a lot of it has to do with how, where you set your casing at, consolidated formations, and then like I said in my presentation, depending on the area that you're drilling and setback, sometimes you have to add extra requirements to the depth of casing set and what formation you go into. Um, so what's the best way to approach a driller that does less than perfect? Are you trying to encourage them on reporting well work testing to the state or do things more or, or do things more in line with rules and regs? 
Um, yeah, that's a, that, um, I'll, you know, I would say if you have a problem with a driller and you're not following the rules, you should talk to them about they need to do that or I would report them you know, personally. I think it's really up to working with a driller there and somebody's got some suggestions. Go ahead. Well, I, it, go ahead, John. buddy. Well, I was going to say, in Michigan, there's all sorts of protocol that they have to follow. But if, if it's just in the beginning and you're starting to see issues, a phone call uh, or a visit to their shop, don't drag them into the regulatory because then you're taking time out of their day. Do things that are going to be more respect, receptive to listen to you, even on a job site. If you if you see them out on a job site, walk up to them and say, "Hey, how do we how do we fix this? How do we correct this? How can we get you to do these things that we need you to do?" Uh, that would be the first thing, in my in my opinion. Yeah, I would add to that is uh, just start off with a general communication uh, conversation on, you know, trying to understand why he was doing. Uh, particular thing that that's not normally done and then explain why we should be doing it a different way uh, before we go into regulatories to try to correct the problem. But we do have that in place as well in North Carolina. Yeah, I'm seeing in Washington, you have to uh, file all your well reports. And I mean, it's a uh, kind of common practice to, uh, you know, give give a copy to that to the customer because it's also posted online later on by the state but the same token you know you got to hold hold people accountable and you do. check around before you hire a well builder to make sure that they're actually do that previously or they're going to repeat the same bad practices all right uh, no and and what i was saying you know i've, I've actually had this situation we have a great well drillers in illinois but there's one guy who um i was working in an area and every person every homeowner in this area told me who the driller was and none of the logs were filed so he has a long record of not filing well logs which you know is against the rules um and i went to him just to try to get the logs and i was unsuccessful i ended up um not doing anything about it to be honest but it's uh that's part of the problem we run into a lot of well owners who don't have logs or even in some states competition <clears throat> so tight with drillers that um, they won't even give them to the well owner after the fact if they didn't require it. So like the advice we give well owners in our class is when you sign a contract with a driller, make sure getting a copy of the well log is part of that because not every state has their logs online like some do. And, um, you know, some states are pretty far behind um, what we see now in California or what you have in Washington. That's not always available online um, or at least, um, yeah, they're certainly not the permits. Okay, um, the next question, to any of the drillers, what is the most prevalent item that you see inspectors overlook during inspections? In what areas regarding well inspections do you commonly see a lack of knowledge from the inspector? That's a very good question. Um, Jeremy? Uh, oh, some of the things that I see is that the most common is safety. They don't know how to approach a well drilling rig. Uh, sometimes they don't flag down and communicate to the driller that they're coming. And a lot of times that's kind of dangerous because a well site with an energized rig, there's a lot of things going on. And if you stand in the wrong spot, it can be dangerous and the <laughs> well driller is liable. So I, I would say safety aspect. Anybody else? And I, I realize this question actually is loaded uh, for you all because you deal with these inspectors every day. So it's fine. I wasn't thinking that I probably shouldn't even ask this question. But I will tell you the safety thing is really an issue. Um, I was on a rig. We had a rig for a while and I was just helping. And the driller was had a 24 inch pipe wrench trying to break two pipes apart and it slipped out of his hand. And the pipe wrench went flying right by my head, um, missed me by about that much. And so, uh, uh, pretty lucky day uh, to not be uh, dead, probably. So, um, it's certainly a thing not to take lightly. One of the things in North Carolina that I've always questioned sometimes is the, uh, the availability to get back to that well area in case we have to work on that well. Um, some of the places that we 
are asked to put wells um, needs to be rethought. And, and I'll bring that up before we drill the well on how we're going to get back to it if we ever need to. I agree with that statement. If, if, the, if it's Eric is asking about the inspection itself, in Michigan, I know that you're only required, health departments are only required to inspect 10% of the permits issued. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's low. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called their minimum program requirements. Um, our association and the welder industry has always pushed for 100% inspections. Mm -hmm. So to me, just doing it to begin with would be great uh, on all of them. Second, when you're there, take the time to inspect everything. Inspect the tank, inspect the, how the discharge fittings are put on, make sure that the sample tap is accessible, uh, inspect the whole well, look at the pipe that they used, how it come in, go out and look at the well, check the cap. A lot of times, um, and we're all busy, I get it. We're all busy. But if you're there on the site, do the whole thing. Yeah, I know in North Carolina, they even video wells sometimes. Uh, yes. Wilson Mize, uh, uh, it's a colleague of mine, and I understand. We had him talk at our last conference about all the video, uh, down home video work he does when he's inspecting wells um, from 2019. Uh, okay, so the next question. Unless I already asked you, this? So, yeah, and I asked the other question to Chauncey first because somebody had asked that, uh, or I wanted to know if they were just testing for bacteria. But um, do you recommend to your clients that they have their water tested by a certified lab or even tested for, you know, Chauncey, you mentioned um, a whole suite of things within 30 days. Um, we see a lot of well owners who um, only have had an initial sample for maybe uh, nitrate and, and coliform or, and bacteria maybe arsenic, and that's it. And so um, I was wondering your thoughts there, because we believe they should test more regularly and for more things. I'll always refer my, cl my clients back to the local health department to pull the sample. Um, and most of the um, health specialists have gone through the well program of what they need to be looking for before they will even pull a sample. If, they, if there's something missing on a well seal, or the well is not protected like it should be, they won't even pull the sample. So that, that's communicating back to the owner of that well that they need to upgrade before a sample can even be taken. Okay. So this morning we had a, um, I, I gave a presentation about our assessment tool and uh, it came up about gaskets on well caps. And so someone asked, um, do all well caps have gaskets? Are there models without? I've never ran across any without, but I'm, you know, I only see, you know, the red monitor caps and one other type most of the time. And since we have you guys from all over the country, um, I thought it was worth asking today. In North Carolina, we do have the um, well seals with the gasket in between. Uh, whenever the, the, the gasket is needs to be replaced, we just replace the whole well seal. Usually the, the bolts need to be replaced as well. Right. So we just replace the whole unit. In Michigan, we don't use a lot of well seals uh, because of the cold weather. So we use pellets adapter, and all of the caps do not have gaskets on it, but they have ridges and have to be tight, and they have to have a vented uh, cap, but they do not all have gaskets. No. Okay. Well, we use a lot of pellets here too, mm -hmm. um, but it's you know you still if you're going to take a water level measurement or you need to get in the well or you're going to you know shock chlorinate. You're still opening that cap, and you see a lot of gaskets that are brittle, gone, and, and all those things. What about In you, In Michigan, James? there's only two people that can take off the cap. That's the well wow. owner and a water well driller. That's it. A sanitarium, nobody else can take the cap off a well. That's probably a really good rule to have. Same in North Carolina. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, so, and this is a question we got beforehand, and I forgot to send them to you guys, so I apologize for that, but um, uh, there was nothing really, yeah, I thought it was okay. Please discuss the risk of drilling in a new location, the possibility of not finding water. I mean, you have your own record, most of the time you're drilling in a particular area. I'm assuming most of the time you have other records to go by, but um, I'm sure every once in a while you get asked to put in a well where you maybe don't have all that information. 
And uh, how do you handle that? And what do you tell the well owner? Well, first I tell them that we have no control over where the water moves through the earth. Um, in my presentation, you see where I had mapped out the areas that we work with the thumbtacks and each thumbtack tells me how deep it was, how much casing we used, how much water we got. Um, so I try to go in up front and explain to the customer, there is always that possibility that we may not get what we want. Um, and it may take multiple wells in order to give them enough reservoir to where they can carry on normal household needs. Um, most of the time they understand it. Some people still don't, um, you know, why'd you go 145 feet on a lot next door with 50 gallons a minute? I'm 600 feet with a gallon a minute. Yeah. You know, it's just the way the water I runs. Through the it is, yeah. I agree with Chauncey. You have to lay all that out way up front. It's, right. it's, if you've ever been in that situation on the backside after the drill rigs on site, uh, it's too late. I, I say too late. It's, it's usually contentious a little bit. Um, so you have to lay that all out front. You have to tell the customer, look, you know, we're in an unknown territory here and we don't know what we're going to run into. So we're going to do the best we can. And, and as Chauncey said, it might take multiple holes. Right. You know, they don't understand it across the street. They got water. Why can't they have it here? Well, well and the, the geology well, is where I drill, it, it, a lot of it has to do with what, what's the definition of success. Some areas that I drill, one to three gallons a minute is success. Other areas, you're going to get 30, 40, 50. You know, as long as you have realistic expectations going into it and address it, you know, lower flow wells, like we address it with well construction where we size up so we can take advantage of that column of water. Mm -hmm. uh, but as long as the information's out in front before you start, the less surprises, the better, you know, because you can't control some of it, but you can't control all of it. Right. right. I would agree. We see that all the time, that's for sure. Um, even where you expect to find it sometimes. Okay. Um, Jeremy, are the uh, Washington residents still required to purchase mitigation certificates in order to be approved for a private well? Do they get to choose the county water bank versus the private water bank? And to the homeowner, is this the price of water versus setback rules modification decision as to which source they select? Out there. So right now, Yakima Basin, which consists of Kittitas County, Yakima County, and Benton County, that's where the uh, mandatory mitigation has been going. And uh, it's kind of funny because a private water bank, you can buy the water at any time before you drill, after you drill, less setbacks. So sometimes it's a little bit better. And there's certain areas or zones that you can only get private water where like in Kittitas County, the county ran water bank, you can't purchase water till after you have the well drilled and there's a well log filed. And then actually there's a time frame. You got one to two years to perfect that or it will expire, which with the private, you know, they actually attach it to the title and it's, it's, it's a piece of water, right? And then, um, yeah, sometimes we got to sit there with the customer and, if if they do have streams and whatnot sometimes it's better to go with the private water bank because it might cost more but in the long run it doesn't impact their site and how they got to set stuff up uh you know because we got type one through nine streams type one and two you know you got to be 500 feet away or you got to do some heavier construction so mm -hmm. yeah it, it just makes the initial site visit that much more in depth and for even to say type one and nine stream is totally foreign to, to me in Illinois. And I understand uh, there's a lot of rules there on the ecology side. So it's just a different animal. Yeah, as a well driller, as a well driller, I've had to become way more into <laughs> what those designations are. I mean, every site I look at, look at I got to know all that stuff. And then, of course, when I go out and do my site evaluation, I have to do measurements and all of that kind of good stuff. So kind of added to the list of being a well driller. Sure. Yeah, I, sure. Had, someone, uh, I had someone I had someone here in Illinois said, you know, we used to just drill wells. <laughs> it's just not that way anymore. So um, it's after noon, but I, I'm going to provide this uh, one more. Just uh, it's kind of open ended. Um, what's the best, best method for detecting leaks? And I'm not sure if they mean in your water line or 
um, you know, in your drop pipe or what that is, but you guys maybe have something pops in your head when you see that question. Pressure I guess uh, one, an one word answer would be pressure. Put some pressure on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, if you guys have a chance to get in the chat and take a look, uh, there's a few other questions, but we're going to wrap up for now. Um, and uh, it, well, yeah. Um, and I appreciate your time and uh, the talks were great and I hope you can stick around and um, thanks for your time. And if anybody has any questions and they come to us, you may get an email from us um, about that. And we appreciate um, all the information you provided today. So thanks for being part of our panel and uh, thanks everyone um, for participating this morning. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.